everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. I'm just going to say the word out loud. We're blaming macro conditions for lack of results, right? B, we are focusing our strategy 80 to 90% on cost cutting and operational efficiency and relying on AI to claim that we're doing it. Yes. And what we need organizations to do is remember strategy has two levers or levers, right? Client, customer and client willingness to pay and reduction in cost. And the most powerful growth strategies move both needles fundamentally apart, not doing things would cause them to bounce. The macro environment is an opportunity set, right? And a silly thing, but what I look for is most strategies have a big risk register. Almost no strategy has an opportunity register. You know, where's appendix two, which says here's all the opportunities in the market that we're choosing not to grab at this point, right? Because we're focusing on these other ones, but just so you know that they're out there. And that's what I'd love to see. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Rebecca okay. Humkes, faculty at London School of Business and Duke. Welcome to the show today. Thanks so much, Scott. It's my pleasure to be here. So we're in this kind of quasi-global recessionary environment for some time, and certainly the UK has been in recession. And we got the backdrop of Ukraine-Russian war, the Israel-Palestine conflict. Mm -hmm. And then from a monetary policy, we got the stubborn inflation, certainly yeah. in the US, that just mm -hmm. keeps the Fed from cutting the Fed funds rate. Mm -hmm. and even possibly entertaining increasing rates. And then on top of that, from a just bigger trend, is that we're in the midst of a dot-com version of Gen AI. So there are a lot of uncertainties mm -hmm. for organizations out there. And one of the things you call out is the fact that when we think about uncertainty, that we shouldn't necessarily think about it in a negative term. And how should organizations and, and leaders think about uncertainty? Yeah, absolutely, Scott. I think you you frame the situation, right? We are, as organizational leaders running companies, trying to have these breakthrough growth strategies, we're facing continued levels of uncertainty. Now, some would argue, as you and I probably would, having seen many cycles of this, we've always been running organizations facing uncertainty, right? But there is something that feels elevated. But there's something about uncertainty that really holds us back when it comes to organizational planning. And that is whenever we speak about or talk about the word uncertainty, we tend to put a word before it that means it's going to be bad. You know, we ask each other, how are you going to manage uncertainty or overcome uncertainty, right? We almost always preface it saying, this thing's going to be nasty. You just have to manage through. So I have to start by fundamentally defining it. You know, uncertainty means a series of future events which may or may not occur. Whether or not those events are good or bad depends on what we're trying to do and how we're set up. So as an organizational leader, see that as your goal. Figure out what we're trying to do and then get set up. And when you reframe in that way, you see these possible opportunity sets rather than all risk to be addressed or overcome. Well, one point is certain is that I think throughout human history, uncertainty has been the norm. So I think mm -hmm. to call it uncertainty, I think it's, it's a bit of a misdemeanor. And you do make an interesting distinction, which is when we think about the future, we're told to plan, but you're saying instead prepare. What, and what is the difference? Yeah, I'm really pushing for this switch or this shift from planning to preparing. Now, that doesn't mean, Scott, that we're throwing planning away. You know, there's going to be parts in your organization where we still need to do planning and operational planning. And when you think about places of your business where the past is a good indicator of the future, right, or we can build linear models that tell us what happens next, planning is probably the right mode there. But when the past is not a good indicator of the future, and we've already called out Gen AI, right, when we're facing these geopolitical tensions, we need to shift into preparation mode. And the biggest shift is you're making decisions based on beliefs, not facts. Now, that sounds scary, especially to organizations who invested a lot in database decisions. But we're not throw saying throw data away. We're saying we've got to start making decisions based on beliefs. And what sets organizations apart who do well through uncertainty is they're better than others at articulating, 
testing, and then acting on beliefs. And the simplest way to think about it is this. By the time something has become a fact in the market, there's no longer a strategic insight. We all have it, right? Growing ahead of the market is about growing faster and better. But yes, we've always been facing uncertainty. You know, uncertainty is in some ways the new certainty. That's what we're going to get. The only challenge I hear from entrepreneurs when I ask them this question, because I ask it, you know, frequently, you know, are we really facing higher levels of uncertainty? Do you remember a time when you ran a company through certain times? The pushback I get, Scott, I'm still trying to share with you is that leaders will say, yes, and we used to be able to take some aspect of geopolitical tensions as a given, right? And now we've got to add that layer on top of it. So there's probably some argument, at least I'm hearing consistently, that there is just this new level and then add AI and Gen AI and how quickly that's going to move, which we, of course, can't predict, which is adding to this layer, which pushes against should we be in planning mode? Now, I know this sounds silly, but I'm going as far as to say, let's not call it the strategic plan. Let's not call it the strategic planning process, because when we call something a plan, there's this notion we must stick to plan. There's this no which is in the plan, we must do it. And I want us heads up and saying from day one, this thing will change and adapt as we execute and as we learn. You know, that's that's interesting because most organizations that engage the likes of McKinsey and BCG yes. organizations that you've uh, are affiliated yeah. with yeah. typically get these very lengthy 100 plus page PowerPoint presentations and they incorporate that into their strategic plan and they try and march by it. But it's almost like we need to do that on a regular basis, but are true leaders doing that and willing to look at and recast and reflect and readjust on a regular, not not even like a semi-annual, but mm -hmm. on a monthly basis? The answer is yes, but it's a new skill set, a new capability to learn and to build. And one of the fundamental things you need to do, Scott, is build change in from day one. Because yes, traditional standing uh, strategic planning process, you hire a consulting firm. If it's just 100 slides, you're lucky, right? Usually it's several hundred slides. It's these big, thick books. But then the trap we fall into is we spend so long developing, we spend so long communicating, we assume everything in the plan must be get done. That plan is a hypothesis based on the understanding and the learnings we had at the moment that we created it. So one thing that we need to do to build that adaptability is when you communicate strategy, you start by communicating your beliefs. We're saying as an organization, these are our top eight to 10 beliefs that are forming our strategic choices. And because of those beliefs, these are our choices and what we're going to do. And as long as those beliefs remain affirmed, this will be our priorities. We will be working on these things. But if these beliefs get challenged, right, expect us to change and adapt. And if you don't communicate the beliefs before the choices, you just communicate the choices, you don't have permission to change. And so that is something you've got to add into the process. And then as you're executing strategy, liken it to parallel pathing from product development, right? We are executing our strategic priorities while we are testing our beliefs. And we're bringing that learning in from that testing of beliefs and constantly updating and adjusting. Because we romanticize these sexy pivots, you know, oh, we're going to make this massive change this way or that. That's not where the real growth usually comes from. It's these constant micro slight adjustments and adaptations we're making as we're executing. And those micro adjustments and adaptations, they don't seem as sexy, but that's what really often leads to those breakthrough growth chances because you're constantly building that adaptability in. So again, I think from a startup environment, I think this makes perfect sense and mm -hmm. I think many smaller organizations are very much inherently agile. Mm -hmm. When we think about large organizations, we'll talk about this a little bit later within yeah. the context of Reset, is that it's one thing to have beliefs, and I think you were referring to beliefs in the sense of maybe like hypotheses or mm -hmm. perception of what the future holds, perhaps. But the fact that even if you communicate the beliefs, you know, can the organization pivot fast enough? Can the middle layer, can the lower staff actually follow suit to adjust and adapt quickly enough to make a difference? They can, but there's a couple of things we need to do differently and great questions. So yes, for, you know, you and I both know the, the startup, the scale up environment quite well. Absolutely. These things are just part of the normal DNA, right? To speak about something else would be what would be funny or weird. Large organizations, in fact, very large organizations can do this and I see them do it, right? And those who apply these processes do, but there's a couple of things we need to put in. One, as mentioned, is those beliefs. So these are our beliefs about where the market's going, where the industry's going, how talent, competitors, customers are going to change and more and being very clear in those beliefs. And the beliefs need to be written in a way you can get them wrong because then I can test them. And you're doing this parallel pathing of testing beliefs and bringing those learnings in. But see, in the strategy of called out, 
which choices are linked to which beliefs. So as you're bringing that learning in, you can make those adjustments and adaptations. And you actually have two trackers. You have a belief tracker and a strategy tracker. But the difference on that belief tracker is it should be wrong sometimes, as in you should see some red on the belief tracker. Because if your belief tracker is always green, I don't assume your team is wonderful at prediction. I assume that we probably haven't been clear enough on some of those beliefs. Now, in terms of speed, though, speed comes from fast decision making, right? And a part of that really comes from knowing, hey, these strategic choices, what are the repeatable, actionable, critical decisions that are come behind them? And then codifying decision-making rights on those decisions. Is codifying decision-making rights and clarifying what makes a good decision at your company? That's what leads to the speed. But Scott, I call it aligned speed, right? Adaptation comes from aligned speed because alignment in choices without speed is too slow to matter in our current environment. But speed without alignment is chaos. So you've got to make sure the key insights in the strategy are there, your beliefs are there, and we've coded to decision-making rights. Otherwise, we can't do some of these principles that we're talking about. Great. So what we're talking about effectively is the essence of your book, Survive, yes. Death, Thrive, Leading Breakthrough Growth Strategy in Volatile Times. And effectively, the premise of the book is that organization can actually grow and outperform under any market conditions, right? Yeah, that's the fundamental hypothesis, and it's proven out time and time again, and I integrate many of the case studies into the book, is that if you do something that I call proactive survive, so you're always set up to stabilize, and you move through these modes effectively and build capability, the market will continue to be cyclical. There will always be swings in the market, but you can build effective business models and strategies that are not. And this is more than recession-proofing the business. This is about being constantly set up to thrive. But the key principle you've got to adapt, Scott, is that growth is a loop not a line. And unfortunately, most of our strategic planning processes and frankly, our innovation planning processes are based on linear models and taking things through stage gates and finishing the strategic planning process, communicating, executing it. And we are trying to put everything in organization into linear processes. And that's not what the market's giving us. Growth is a loop, not a line. And it's about successfully and constantly moving through these three modes of the survive, reset, thrive loop. Again, I, I'm not sure that that's necessarily yeah. hugely controversial there, but let's get into mm -hmm. the, the granularity of survive, reset, and mm -hmm. thrive, starting with survive. So how can organizations proactively stabilize? So a lot of this, again, is moving beyond just the recession proofing. It's what I call them the four C's for simplicity. And again, this will not be not only controversial, but hopefully not new to any of your listeners. And the four C's are cash, cost, customers, communication. And it's agreeing as a leadership team, where do these basic principles need to be right, at all times, even in the frothy markets? Because what happens is we lose discipline. When markets are frothy and interest rates are low and things are booming, it's very easy to lose discipline, to overspend, to overhire. And you're putting the organizational growth ahead of the market growth because you assume that this current st uh, steepness of the curve will always stay there. And it often doesn't. So you're putting these basics in place. That way, when there is a shock that hits the system and shocks can be external or shocks can be internal, you have less to do than others. So let's talk about current times. So you, yeah. you're seeing across different industries where not only is there a significant cost cutting because they want to drive up their earnings mm -hmm. per share, but there are also significant buybacks. But you have this notion of the fact that you want your employees to march in alignment, but yet at the same mm -hmm. time, there are significant layoffs morale is down. Uh, certainly certain industries like financial mm -hmm. services are mandating not even three, but mm -hmm. five days at work, which yes. has been a kind of a pushback. Mm -hmm. So in this kind of a low morale, questionable loyalty environment, how do you actually make these strategic transitions to survive? Well, I think your the fundamental premise is that you're already in this, which I'm sure some organizations are, is taking a step back is that the more uncertainty organizations are facing, the more I find that they're begging the leadership team for alignment, right? The more there's kind of change, the more that we can't see clearly into the future, the more as employees, they look to their leadership team for alignment and they're ready to move and leave that company if they don't see it there, right? And so a big part of this is embracing and having the ability to communicate where we are across these three different modes and why it matters for that point in time is that employee engagement is strategic in the survive mode and many would argue at all three modes. And as a leader, being able to manage the emotional energy of these different modes too. Now, I would also argue that 
you know, these steep layoffs often come from the overbuilding, right? I call it the swinging. You know, when markets are frothy, we're overspending and overgoing. When there's market cuts, we want to lay off, we want to do furloughs, we slash cutting, we cut all of the, you know, T&E and all of those other things. And you're constantly swinging. Now, what happens when you do that is as an organization, you're not building capability in either. You're not getting great at being a growth company. You're also not being great at being a company that's lean. So it's about being this, building this capability so you can be proactive in all aspects. But as a leader, clear communication, being able to communicate directions, even we can't communicate precise directions, it, sorry, to precise destinations and managing the emotional energy at all parts of the modes. Now you have organizations that are not fundamentally market leaders. They're, they're mm-hmm. laggards to, to say yes. the least. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's go back to the AI as an example. You got yeah. Microsoft that has, of course, significant investment to open mm-hmm. AI. They have actually integrated that into many of their product lines mm-hmm. and they're actually showing revenue, significant revenue. Mm-hmm. Everybody's trying to follow. And certainly for those that are laggers that perhaps are suffering, whether it's market cap or earnings, Mm -hmm. they think that by hooking onto the Gen AI momentum that they can survive. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? Look, this is a super interesting market. And I've got several, as I'm sure that you do as well. First is what's missing from most organizational strategies and a critical piece of the reset is the notion of what is our right to win or competitive advantage. And over the past few years, the notion of competitive advantage has been really muddled down to vague generic terms about customer centricity or innovative or great team, et cetera. And really being able to fundamentally answer the question, what do we have that others don't? And what can we do that others can't? And how can we build a moat around our advantage? And if you look at, we'll geek out for a minute here, if you look at the basic AI kind of tech stack in an organization, and you start going through each piece, it's insane how quickly you realize almost every single step here is commoditized or will be soon. You know, most LLMs are trained on publicly available data. We'll come back to whether or not you can build advantage there. You know, cleaning and labeling, those steps are commoditized and repeatable. You know, most organizations in an industry have the same opportunities and use cases available to them. So all of these different steps are commoditized or can be copied. There's only really two pieces you can build competitive advantage, and that's proprietary data, though most companies way overemphasize there, and then it's learning how quickly you can build the learning loops to cycle between them. So companies that are trying to catch up, it's, you know, it's not a strategy to try to catch up. Now you might say we've got a capability of being a fast follower. Very few do, but it fundamentally comes down to what do we have that others don't and what can we do that others can't and how can we build moats and outside of proprietary data, which I'll repeat, most companies overestimate how much that is the right to win. The fundamental advantage is going to come down to learning and some companies are investing in it, prioritizing it, mapping out the critical learning loops, trying to close them and increase velocity. Most are not and are just throwing money at the actual data. Mm -hmm. But by definition, if you can get the data from other places, so can anybody else. And spending more cash than everyone else, as we know from every previous boom and bust cycle, is not the answer to building a right to win. So what we're talking about right now is we've transitioned to the topic of reset, which yes. is the second component. Mm-hmm. And of course, most organizations are going to internalize that as what they are very good at, which is reorg. So they're continuously yes. reorganizing different people, reporting to different people, calling their organization something mm-hmm. different, consolidating, separating. Is that a real risk reset? And how can they really think mm-hmm. about reset? And you also mentioned something called must win battle. What yes. is it? So reset means change. And to really do the reset, you need to go into the process assuming that you're going to change something, but you don't necessarily need to. So Scott, fundamentally the reset is revisiting the critical strategic assumptions that led to your main choices, our beliefs, our right to win, our where to play choices, where we want to be in three years, and then how we're going to get there are our must wins. And as you cycle through those critical questions, you know, what's the situation? What's our right to win? Where are we going to play? Where do we want to be in three years? And how are we going to get there? Those top priorities. What are the assumptions we made in the previous cycle or before the shock? Are those assumptions still valid? Where are the key growth insights? And it's about those insights. Strategy has fundamentally lost the insights. We are all filling in the same templates from the same books. We call them something different at the end, whether they're rocks or OKRs or KPIs or aims, objectives, goals, but we're filling in the same templates, You know, every book just slightly rewritten. I don't see insights very often anymore. Where are those keen insights about where we're going to carve out a different niche in the playing field? Where are we fundamentally delivering a different job to our customers? What is a belief we have about the industries changing that we can get ahead of? So I'm arguing in the reset, give enough of a pause, you can bring the insights back into strategy. Then at the end, 
call the top priority something that matters. And it doesn't need to be the term must win battles. That's the term that I use, but the term has to have integrity. There needs to be a term that stands for the top three to five things that matter the most for growth going forward. And we don't like to do this link back to the employee engagement point is organizations. And I see this happen so frequently. They might even do all of these things we're talking about, have those insights, have that small list of priorities. And then they're worried about fairness in the end. And they want to make sure that every team, every department, every function has a strategic priority. So everyone feels like they're part of the process. And in doing so, your strategy has just become a rearticulation of what you do as a business. And that's a great test of your strategy. Is your strategy just rearticulating what you do as a business? That's not a strategy. You've just rewritten your business model. Strategy has those key growth insights, and it will be a short list every three years, which means every team function department will not have a strategic priority, and that's okay. Their job during that cycle is supporting and enabling the others. We need to get great in communicating. All of our employees are equally valued, but when it comes to strategy, just a few things will matter over any midterm strategy cycle. So let's talk about something that uh, perhaps maybe we don't like to talk about, which yeah. is the fact that many executives and mid-tier managers alike, frankly, are lacking, substantively lacking strategic insights, much like mm -hmm. what you're saying. And in some cases, or most cases, they're looking to outside consultancies for those strategic insights, partly because they don't have it. Mm -hmm. And because if for some reason those strategic insights are wrong, they can blame it on the consultancy rather mm -hmm. than themselves. Yes. What is the issue with that model? There's a couple issues with the model. And look, you can pull into strategic consultancies if you need help, if your team's not large enough or doesn't have the insights or doesn't have the data. But if you don't fundamentally own the strategy, if you're doing that so you can have someone to plash it off onto, then you're never going to have the buy-in that you need internally for the execution. And those processes also tend to over-index on scenarios and over-index on risk management rather than getting to those few key insights and fundamentally making choices. You know, strategy is about making choices. I know that sounds cliche. That's not controversial. But nine out of 10 strategies don't actually make them. You know, everything stays on the list, so it's not there. So that is a great input, I say, into strategy. But the final strategy has to take that distill down to its essence and make those final choices. And by definition, most consultants are not going to make those choices for you. You need to make them and own them based on the beliefs you as a leadership team hold. Well, that's, uh, believe it or not, it's a scarce thing, isn't it? It unfortunately now, is. Yes. Let's, uh, going back to the example of AI, yeah. and the reason I'm doing that is so that our listeners have yeah. something concrete to hold on to. Absolutely. Some of these cloud firms, let's say, are struggling in the sense that, uh, let's talk about the laggers, where the cloud providers are working with customers that are still on-premise. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're still on mainframe or whatever mm -hmm. it is, but they prefer to have control over their IT environment, haven't really migrated to mm -hmm. private or public cloud or any of that. And then, of course, the challenge is moving them upstream to cloud is one thing, but they can't get any of the gen AI or any other new capabilities mm -hmm. unless they're in cloud. So you got this conundrum, and you, so you're trying to create this moat, this defensibility, this comparative advantage, but you're dealing with a very stubborn, lagger customer base. What is a strategic insight for somebody like that? Well, the strategic insight would come back to what's the fundamental beliefs and assumption. You know, how I like to always reframe the conversation is what assumptions are we making that keeping our data on premise based on, and really try to tease out those assumptions, and. I think that we are challenging all of the ones we used to say because it's more secure. You know, we used to say because our customers won't feel comfortable if their data has gone to the cloud. Those assumptions were challenged over a decade ago, right? Some way before that, and we know that. So I think it's really teasing out and understanding what are the assumptions you're making behind those choices. It is very difficult to build moats, right? If you don't have those insights, again, into those same simple questions, what do we have that others don't? What can we do that others can't? And if you know, if those were listeners in the consultancy advisor role, that is, you know, that's the push time, right? And being able to say, you know, what are those beliefs and assumptions? Where is everyone else? We've got to move out of that. Again, those issues yeah. have been resolved a uh, yeah. decade and a half ago. The yes. Issue, I think is uh, there are employees where they're incented to keep their jobs at those mm -hmm. uh, customer companies, and they want to make sure that it's status quo. So let's uh, go back to the three uh, components here. So mm -hmm. we talked about creating a strong balance sheet from the survival mode. We yeah. talked about strategic insights from the reset mode. Mm -hmm. 
And then now we're getting into Thrive. Yes. How, how do we transition to Thrive so that we have this constant agility and learning? Yeah, so the transition from Reset to Thrive is surprisingly difficult, even though you would think that that would be the one that all organizations want to move into, because you're building this kind of flexible, adaptable process as you're moving in. But the key differentiator is executing with agility and learning. And I know that sounds cliche, so let's break it down. So again, if you want to be these Thrive organizations, you brought the strong balance sheet from the survive phase. You've got these insights, as you've mentioned, then executing with agility and learning means that you have four your key decisions. You have codified out, here's where the critical decisions are and who owns them. And here's what makes a good decision here. And that sounds simple, Scott, but as a company saying, what makes a good decision here? Once you've codified the variables of a good decision at your company, you have now empowered all employees to move quickly in grabbing those and then executing with learning. Organizations that learn faster, grow faster. Learning velocity is the key differentiator. And again, working with so many companies on their AI-based strategies, that is fundamentally coming back to that same insight. It is about the velocity at which you have these learning loops across your organization. If you think about that constant loop, and it's another loop of execute insight embed. I execute something in the market, I get the insight, I embed it in the organization. Most organizations, one of those three steps breaks out in the loop. I'm executing, not looking for insights. I get the insight, but I don't acknowledge it. And then fundamentally, I don't embed it in the organization. So the next time I do, I can do it better. And if you can close that loop constantly, execute, insight, embed, that's how you maintain being a Thrive organization. So one of the issues with that fundamentally is the fact that at the C-level, Mm -hmm. There is plenty of data that shows that the turnover rate, certainly at the CEO and yes. other C, mm -hmm. is just incredibly high. So any any strategic things that they try to lay out, they're rarely able to see it through. And then the other thing is kind of mid-tier and lower level is because you got these significant displacement and layoffs, a lot of the institutional knowledge and these insights that they've learned are mm -hmm. also leaving and they're being replaced with lower skill, lower level, lower experience so that the costs is driven down mm -hmm. there's some something fundamentally wrong i i think based on what you're saying and what i'm seeing in the marketplace how can organizations balance this notion of having a healthy balance sheet so that they can have mm -hmm. positive earnings report keep growing their capital market capital market um, uh, value but at the same time holding on to these continuous insights and embedding it into the strategy and and improving it ceo tenure and time for value creation are moving in the opposite direction, right? Value creation is midterm. You know, a strategy cycle should be three years. Often we need a foundational strategy before we can have the breakthrough growth strategy. So you're looking at three to six years, which is again, fundamentally more than most CEO timeframes. Part of it comes down to the beliefs. Unfortunately, being able to say to the market, this is our beliefs because these beliefs, here are our choices, here's how long it's going to take us. CEOs can only credibly do that in a publicly traded company if they've credibly done it before, right? So as a CEO, if you have a consistent track record of making these statements, here's our beliefs, here's our choices, here's the time, and then meeting them, the market will give you patience again. But because that cadence is not often followed, right? And because a lot of CEOs don't have that credibility, we're seeing this. But what I'm seeing, Scott, happen is because of this, there is a reluctance to make choices because you're afraid of getting something wrong. You're afraid the two or three things you take off the table will be the ones that were it. So we're seeing more companies leave everything on the table, right? And then again, you don't have a strategy. Your strategy is your business model. And so the reluctance to make choices comes down to this not having enough time, right? And that not having enough time means we leave everything on, which means we're not really focusing on those few things that matter the most for value creation. So going back to the basics, beliefs, insights, communicating it credibly, constantly going back with updates and being prepared to adjust and adapt. We often have this framing and this bias because we developed it, we wanna keep executing it. But saying the beginning, here's the beliefs, as a belief get challenged, we might change. And those things together, are there fewer examples than the opposite? Absolutely, but we are seeing them in the market. So let's talk about the realities of what executives are facing today. Yes. So again, I haven't seen a conclusive evidence per se, but anecdotally, what we're seeing is that companies from an alpha risk reward perspective, those that are exceeding the market expect analyst expectations around quarterly earnings, for example, are not getting rewarded properly, right? And then mm -hmm. whatever they're doing from a strategy is being kind of overshadowed by the macros. It's whatever the interest rate, the yeah. macro policy, the geopolitical. So it's almost like it doesn't really matter. So to your point, to an extent, mm -hmm. these executives are choosing to be more cautious and rather thinking 
let's just focus on cost cutting and less on the things that's going to really drive strategic growth over long term. Yeah, and this is this is an issue, right? And if you think the definition of strategy is creating value, value creation is about driving a gap between customer and client willingness to pay and total cost. What are we seeing in the market? A, I'm just going to say the word out loud, we're blaming macro conditions for lack of results, right? B, we are focusing our strategy 80 to 90% on cost cutting and operational efficiency and relying on AI to claim that we're doing it. Yes. And what we need organizations to do is remember strategy has two levers or levers, right? Client, customer and client willingness to pay and reduction in cost. And the most powerful growth strategies move both needles fundamentally apart, not doing things what cause them to bounce. The macro environment is an opportunity set, right? And a silly thing, but what I look for is most strategies have a big risk register. Almost no strategy has an opportunity register. You know, where's appendix two, which says here's all the opportunities in the market that we're choosing not to grab at this point, right? Because we're focusing on these other ones, but just so you know that they're out there. And that's what I'd love to see. So I think what we're seeing again is blaming macro conditions rather than looking for opportunities. And I call them kickers and killers. And it's stopping asking the question, what could happen? It's a terrible question to ask. One, we can't predict the future. We're all terrible at it. Well, maybe a few of us aren't, but most of us are. And two, when we ask what would happen, we go into a bias of protection mode. So instead, I ask CEOs and teams to say, what could make us, what could break us? And here's the thing, Scott. If you ask a team to say, what could break us, they will list 15 things very clearly in less than five minutes. If you say, okay, now give me things, what could make us, it takes hours. And I'm not exaggerating hours and i've got to kind of stir the brainstorming and the ideation and then we get there you know what happens every single time regardless of size of company or industry over 60 percent of their what could make us the kickers are just do it's like they could be doing it right now it's not really an outsized opportunity so that's how i try to get away from these things we're talking about the blame culture the only the needle down we say what could make us what could break us but my rule is i need 30 good what could make us before you're allowed to discuss what could break us and that's where you set some of those growth insights coming in i love that so on that note i have enjoyed my dr rebecca humkes faculty yes. at london school of business and duke thanks for joining thank, us. thank you so much scott it was my pleasure if you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.